July 30, 2008, one of the most horrific murders in Canadian history played out on a Greyhound bus traveling from Edmonton to Winnipeg when passenger Vincent Lee attacked and killed Timothy McLean, an innocent stranger to Vincent who was traveling home after finishing a long stretch working Klondike days at the Capital X in Edmonton. Here we will take a look at Timothy McLean the earnest and universally loved Rolling Stone whose life was abruptly cut short, and Vincent Lee, the man who crossed that line, stabbing and then cannibalizing the body of Timothy during a lengthy standoff with police, and the shocking outcome of his trial and unjustly short incarceration. In this, Episode 5 of Something Criminal. summer 2008 in the city of Champions, and Edmonton is right in the middle of its long run of festivals and fairs. Through the months of May to September, there is not one day there isn't some citywide festival, a cornucopia of sights, sounds, and food. July is the mother of all months in Edmonton. Fringe Fest, Taste of Edmonton, Street Performers Festival, and a plethora of music festivals. Amidst the throng of activities is Klondike Days the annual carnival of epic proportions with outrageous coasters and rides, music acts and competitions, and multiple pavilions that house everything from flea markets to petting zoos. Carnivals are a thing of wonder, harbingers of happiness traveling through town once or, if you're lucky, twice a year. The nostalgic smell of pizza bites and mini donuts wafting through the midway, the cries of thrill-seekers strapped into the zipper, spinning around wildly in the one car that is certain to fail. The clanging and banging of rides and constant heckling in the background. Game masters challenging you to test your skill at impossible games. The sights, sounds, and smells can be intoxicating. Bears were once upon a time a rite of passage. From family trips as a child riding the kitty coaster, and throwing darts or flipping quarters with dad for that one oversized teddy bear you want so badly. To later years, as a teen, sneaking beers and joints with your friends behind the Gravitron, hoping to see that guy or girl from school you promised yourself a kiss from. There is a strange romanticism surrounding carnivals in carny life. You would be hard pressed to find someone without a smile ear to ear inside fairgrounds, lest it be from relief as they burst into safety from the haunted house or running for a garbage can holding their mouths after a particularly wild coaster. Carnival life as a career attracts a certain kind of person. They are usually a little rough, wild and nomadic, modern day gypsies peddling dreams of when we, the plebes, were young, and to the youngsters, just plain dreams. Camaraderie is par for the course in this working environment and the connections made can often be just as strong as the bonds of family, and for many of them, it is their family. Some people were born into carny life, others are there to try and escape, a sort of job of last resort. And then there are some who are there by choice, perhaps seeking those dreams they had tasted the night before strolling the midway. The carnival is a landlocked cruise ship with all of the employees, in the very least, there for the adventure. Timothy was born on October 3, 1985, 
to parents Carol and Timothy Sr. His parents are divorced, but they were still close, and Tim divided his time between his mother in Winnipeg and father in nearby Eli. He's from a big family, being one of seven siblings. His extended family is massive, and that's not including Tim's friends, a large circle of people stretching the nation, many of which would be considered by Tim as family as well. While researching this story, I made contact with a few of those who were close to Tim. A few were open to regaling stories of times past, and all are still protective over his memory, and I understand that. They unanimously agree that Timothy was one of those people, if you're lucky, you meet once in your lifetime. That someone who leaves such an impression on you that their memory of them is as clear and fresh as if it were yesterday. The blazing beam of a human being they were, making them an easy person to miss and an even harder person to forget. And for that reason, turning back to look upon something so tragic and painful is a hard ask of anyone. I made a promise to respect Tim's memory, a delicate task as many still hold him close and fear the twisting of the person he was. That is not my intention here. I wish instead to paint a picture of the man before the murder, the shining light of a human who would have given the shirt off his back to anyone who needed it. Tim was a wild child right from the start, growing to be a firecracker of a man at 5'5 and 125 pounds. He was a good-looking man, athletic, with a true charmer's smile. Curious and active, as a child he would constantly be getting into this or doing that. He was a perpetual prankster, harmless fun, that was never at the expense of another. Tough and outspoken, he understood boundaries. He was more of a Don Quixote than a Holden Caulfield, having a zest for life and adventure and a passion for people. Not one to be held down by stereotypes, he earned his self-pronounced nickname, Joker Wild, a tribute as a juggalo to the cult horrorcore group, Insane Clown Posse. Juggalos are notoriously family-driven, a gathering of fans that refuse to judge based on race, social status, or any other egocentric title. They accept everyone, just like Tim. Women often fell easily for that sparkle in his eye and wit of tongue. Whether he knew it or not, he was a heartbreaker through and through. A friend first, though, as Tim would make sure. He thrived in connections with people on all levels, not driven by singular or selfish means. He had been a beacon of light for everyone he knew at some point in their lives. Tim had dreams of traveling. Feeling the bland pressures of prairie life in Manitoba, he had a desire to see Canada, and when his friend suggested he apply for the carnival she worked at, it seemed like an easy choice for Tim, a working way of stretching his wings away from home. Carnival life isn't easy, working from open to close and then long after that cleaning up and getting ready for the next day. Sleeping in campers or makeshift bunks for maybe four hours a night, if at all, They'd be up bright and early to do it all again the next day. Tim was no stranger to hard work, and his solid ethic and inherent reliability made him an easy fit for the lifestyle. His outgoing personality and ability to make a friend out of literally anyone gave Tim a home away from home. Letting him travel with a motley crowd of work hard, play hard, die hards. Carney life was good for Tim, and he was doing exactly what he had dreamed. Traveling Canada, making friends and money while doing it. Often spending it as quickly as it came in. At 22, he had seen most of Canada. The method of transportation like many in the 90s and early thousands, the Greyhound. In 2008, Greyhound business was reaching the end of an era. An age of buses that only partially recovered after hitchhiking became a lost tradition and affordable flights flooded the travel market. Bus travel, although much longer and arguably not much cheaper, held a certain uniqueness to it. It allowed passengers a kind of communal travel and different perspective on distances. The tight quarters meant you would invariably meet the person in the aisle next to you at layovers or in just plain conversation stemming from the inevitable restless boredom. And this is where Tim thrived, in conversation, engaging, 
is curiosity an undeniably infectious thing. Everyone on a bus has a story, a story unlike those who fly, separate from briefcases and dossiers. Bus stories are usually those of struggle and patience, escaping and arriving, traveling on a budget, or to take in the countryside from a perspective only a bus can give. It's a metaphor of sorts, a lengthy and scenic journey, the last stop at the end of a predictably and long winding road. For Tim, that road led to British Columbia and the West Coast. Vancouver Island is famous for its mild weather and rolling green mountaintops tinged with white snow in winter, the evergreen slopes falling away to sandy shorelines. The rich ocean air hits the senses like the sea climbs the beach in waves and it can be hypnotic. Life is just a little more relaxed on British Columbia's coast and there is a laid back atmosphere there. It is comforting. The clean air and lush rainforests and people of a generally communal thread can cast a spell on a person very quickly. Tim fell in love immediately. He had made a decision. He was coming back. Well, I'm on the Nanaimo Ferry, getting ready to leave the island. So, uh, yeah, I gotta talk close to this thing so it can hear me. Basically, I'm just walking around the ferry. Cars getting loaded. I'm definitely gonna have to come back here someday soon. Rather than continue on with the carnival to its next stop in Regina, Tim decided that after Edmonton for K days, he would travel home to Winnipeg and gather up his things to move to BC. He was ecstatic. Tim, a leaf caught in the wind, gracefully following where it took him, now had a bigger purpose a pivotal choice, and he saw his whole life ahead of him. July 30th, 2008. Klondike days had just ended. Tim had worked the entire 10-day stretch, a grueling week and a half that caters to almost a million people. Pockets flush with cash, but tired. He was relieved to be heading home. Buying a Greyhound ticket, he ambled onto the bus. Number 1170, eastbound for Winnipeg. Departing 12 noon. Vincent Li Wei Guang was born in Dandong, Liaoning, China, on April 30, 1968. A smart man with a knack for electronics, he graduated from the University of Wuhan with a Bachelor of Science in Computers. He worked in Beijing briefly as a computer software engineer until 1998, when he started down the path of his dream of immigration to Canada with his wife, Anna. On June 11, 2001, their visas approved they moved to Ontario. Vincent and Anna worked whatever jobs they could, initially happy to put money away while they settled in and pursued citizenship. Neither of the two were fluent in English, and there was a distinct language barrier. People who knew Vincent commented on the frustration he often felt at not being able to communicate with or understand his peers. After a short stay in Toronto, the two moved to Winnipeg in hopes that a change of environment might do them both some good both of them working menial jobs once again. One of the jobs Vincent worked was at Grand Memorial Church. He had gained the support and friendship of the church pastor, Tom, and decided to adopt Christianity, getting baptized in the process. It was then that an obsessive faith began to creep in, complementing his deteriorating mental state. Vincent had begun to hear voices. Vincent and Anna had begun to experience problems at home. In 2004, Anna recalls how Vincent started strange eating routines and rarely slept. He was becoming erratic and unpredictable. They started arguing about anything and everything. Their marriage was falling apart. Sadly, distinct cultural differences combined with the frustration of their inability to communicate in English effectively stopped either of them from seeking help for Vincent. Vincent's increasingly odd behavior got worse and in March of 2005 he began traveling frequently, taking bus trips or flights to locales he had no need to be. Suddenly Vincent left for Thompson, Manitoba, 
where he surprisingly bought a parcel of land. He was broke, but bought the land anyways. Anna could not handle the rips in marriage any longer, and they separated. She still loved him deeply and supported him in any way she could, giving him shelter, food, and money. In 2005, Vincent abruptly left for Toronto, and after a short while lay aimlessly wandering the city, the voice commanded him back to Winnipeg. He threw out his luggage and began walking the highway westbound. He was picked up by the police and taken to William Osler Health Center in Etobicoke for observation. Attendants reported him as being vague and spaced out. He seemed to be hallucinating and generally incoherent. Doctors noted in their examination that Vincent had not eaten or slept in days. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and given medication. However, Vincent refused to take it. In Canada, there is no law that mandates a patient must take his prescriptions, regardless of the harm it may cause them or others. Because of this, doctors placed Vincent in an involuntary 14-day admission, a Form 3 certificate detaining him for fear of hurting himself or others. Ten days later, Vincent walked out of the hospital and left for Winnipeg, breaching the provincial order. There would be no recourse to the breach. Mental health laws do not reach interprovincially. In Manitoba, Vincent was essentially free. Vincent would travel home to China often, and in 2006, he begrudgingly sought medical help. However, strangely, he was given a clean bill of health by the attending doctor. Back in Canada, he moved back in with Anna in her Toronto home in 2007. Anna remembers how out of sorts he looked, frazzled, distant, and looking like a homeless person. Vincent continued to avoid treatment, convinced he did not need it. In June of 2008, while working at Walmart, Vincent was in some sort of altercation with fellow employees. Although he was grossly reliable and had an impeccable work ethic, he was terminated. A month later, he went up and disappear, settling in Edmonton, leaving a note for Anna that simply said, Don't look for me. I wish you were happy. July 29th, 2008. Vincent purchases a Greyhound ticket from Edmonton back to Winnipeg and boards the bus. During the ride, he sat silently alone, wrestling with the voice that had grown louder and louder, dominating his life. Vincent was now convinced he was the second coming of Christ and was meant to save the planet from an alien invasion, recording his deeds in his journal, A New Testament. Seven hours later, the Greyhound stopped in Erickson, Manitoba, Vincent suddenly collected his luggage and got off the bus, making his way to a nearby bench where he reportedly sat the entire night, motionless, straight and stiff. By morning, Vincent had fashioned a makeshift for sale sign that read, Laptop for sale, 600 bucks. This caught the attention of a teenage boy, 15-year-old Darren Beatty, who bartered with Vincent and after a short back and forth, the teen surprisingly rode away with a brand new laptop. I looked at him, looked at the laptop, and I was going to go in, but he kind of got up and uh, said, do I want to buy it? And I said, well, I don't have that much money. And then he said, you know, I said, 60 bucks. <laughs> and then he said, OK. And then I shook his hand on it, and then he won more money for the bag. And I said, that was OK. I'd just take the laptop. At 6.55 p.m. July 30th, the next Greyhound heading to Winnipeg pulls up to Erickson Station. Vincent is waiting. He boards the bus, pausing at the head of the aisle, surveying the passengers. Slowly, he walked towards the back, gripping a roll of toilet paper and his journal, dark black sunglasses shrouding his eyes. He stops, two rows from the back. Tim looks up from his seat next to the window as Vincent settles in next to him. Tim smiles, offers a hello, and tucks back into his corner. The Greyhound doors close, and it slowly crawls from the depot on the home stretch to Winnipeg.
Mask of Zorro was playing on the tiny bus TVs, and it had just passed Portage la Prairie, a township about an hour from Winnipeg. Timothy had not moved from his spot two seats from the back since Edmonton. He'd sat alone for the majority of the ride, exhausted. He slipped in and out of sleep, and in Erickson, Manitoba, when Vincent Lee boarded the Greyhound and took the empty seat beside him, Tim thought nothing of it, politely saying hi before returning to his pillow. Stephen Allison, who sat in the seat across the aisle from Tim, recalls the intensity that Vincent bore. Motionless and stiff, he was wearing blackout sunglasses, clutching a roll of toilet paper and a journal. Something was strange about the new passenger, something ominous. He was sitting there rocking back and forth, chanting something, but it wasn't in English, so I didn't know what he said. So. But that was really, really weird. That was when I was like, okay, something's going down, something's going to happen. But my second thought was, if I get up, go and start saying something, he might say, oh great, someone's found me out, and then look over and see my wife sitting next to me, and decide to go after her instead. Stephen studied Vincent, who went between staring straight ahead to staring at Tim. Everything seemed wrong about Vincent. His overly tight composure, wearing sunglasses and gripping the toilet paper. Stephen froze when Vincent suddenly pulled out a knife, turning on an unsuspecting Tim, and began emotionlessly and mechanically stabbing him. There was immediate panic as Tim screamed out. Stephen Allison tumbled into the aisle, screaming for the bus to stop, racing for the door. The bus slammed on the brakes and swerved to the shoulder. Passengers blindly jumped from their seats, pushing over each other for safety. Most unclear at this point exactly what they were running from. Tim had struggled free from his spot against the window and somehow clambered over Vincent, falling into the aisle. Vincent did not relent, however. Spinning around, he was again on top of Tim, continuing the mechanical and emotionless stabbing. Well, at that point, Tim had tried to jump over Vince Lee and landed in the aisle. And so right there in the aisle beside her, and Vincent Lee was still stabbing. Yeah, it was on top of him, continually stabbing him. It had been about 50 or 60 times by that point. So there was no hope of anything. As passengers fled, some looked back to pinpoint the source of the panic and were greeted with a horrifically graphic scene. Forever burnt in their minds, something no person should ever have to see. All of them remember the screams. Overpowered. Tim died where he fell into the aisle. Chris Alguier was in a truck following the Greyhound when he saw it suddenly swerve to the shoulder. Thinking the bus might have blown a tire or have a mechanical issue of some kind, Chris pulled over to help. Walking up to the bus, it was immediately apparent something was wrong. People were scrambling off the bus, panicked and worried. Being told what was happening, Chris returned to his truck and retrieved a steel pipe. Heading back to the bus, another Samaritan joins in on his apprehension. Chris and the accomplice enter the bus brandishing weapons. Staring down the aisle, they are greeted by an emotionless Vincent, empty, mechanical, and absent. Did he say anything? Nothing. What, what did you see when you looked at him? I said it before, it was empty. Expressionless? Yes. Yeah, that's a good word for it. Expressionless. And then during this time, Vince Lee then he kneeled down over Tim McLean's body, and that's when uh, we had started to watch him behead him. I'd never wanted to hurt somebody so severely in my life until that point. And that still hasn't changed. Vincent was not backing down, and Chris had to make a decision. Yes, with head in one hand and knife in the other, and made his way towards me. It's, it's a tough decision. The hardest decision there was that there's women and children and other men who are counting on me, I suppose, to not let this guy get away. And if, if I was thinking about myself ahead of them, I would have tried to take him out, to disable him. 
As Chris held the door waiting for authorities, passengers and onlookers were terrorized by Vincent, who seemed to taunt the crowd emotionlessly with his pacing of the bus, bloodied and robotic. I remember seeing him walking up and down the aisle with the head, like it was a prize. Walking in front of the window, the main window where the bus driver, the front window, walking back and forth with the head, not knowing, like, as if it was a prize. Police arrived at 9 p.m. A team of negotiators, RCMP, canine units, detectives. The crime scene was very quickly isolated. On radio, police called Vincent Badger and for the next four hours attempted to talk him off the bus. All the while, he mutilated and cannibalized Tim, parading body parts for the officers. Badger appears to be a six foot tall Asian male, with short dark hair, black t-shirt, armed with a knife right now. Badger is armed with a knife and a pair of scissors and he's defiling the body at the front of the bus as we speak. Uh, Zulu Delta 1 at your leisure, could you give me a shot? Okay, uh, Badger's at the back of the bus, um, hacking off pieces and eating it. At some point, Lee attempted to start the bus. However, it had been remotely immobilized. At around 1 a.m. on July 31st, Vincent smashed through a window and attempted to run away. He was caught immediately. Police on scene noted how confused he looked while being put in cuffs, lost and unsure why he was being arrested. The trial, a short and shockingly decisive affair, began on March 3rd, 2009 with Vincent pleading NCRMD, or not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder. This plea meant that he accepted the offense that had happened, but was unable to form the necessary mental element, or mens rea. This is commonly known as the insanity defense. The judge heard testimony from a number of psychiatrists and physicians that supported Vincent's claim of insanity. The judge would ultimately agree and remanded him to Selkirk Mental Health Center until a time where he was seen as mentally fit. In 2008, Greyhound's marketing campaign was a banner reading, there's a reason you don't read about bus rage. This was immediately pulled following the July 30th murder on bus 1170. This would also be yet another milestone in the steady decline of Greyhound bus lines. Ridership fell year over year in exponential amounts, and in 2018, Greyhound announced termination of all Western Canadian routes, laying off 415 people. Everyone there that night lived through the horrors. Some people can push it away, others can't avoid it. All of them are affected for life. Most, if not all passengers and witnesses to the events on bus 1170 have experienced some sort of post-traumatic stress. One passenger who had already suffered from a mental illness gave birth a few months after the murder. However, her newborn was taken by social workers because they feared her subsequent PTSD coming from July 30th, combined with her current condition, made her unfit to care for her daughter. The baby was in a foster home for the first 18 months of her life, but was eventually returned to her maternal family, her grandmother winning sole custody over her. In 2011, still feeling wholly traumatized by the events, Two passengers filed a lawsuit against Vincent Lee, Greyhound, the RCMP, and the Government of Canada, asking for $3 million in damages to compensate for witnessing the murder. 
The suit was later dropped in 2015, as Greyhound could not be sued under Manitoba's system of no-fault insurance. They both continue therapy and treatment for the lasting effects of PTSD. Chris is one of the many that suffers from PTSD after witnessing the events of July 30th. He admits in resorting to alcohol to help cope with his fits of rage and depression. I've become an alcoholic to help me sleep at night. I know better and don't think my reaction is surprising to anyone. However, I hate what challenges me daily now. Ken Barker was an RCMP dog handler veteran that attended the crime scene on July 30th. He was one of the attendants who had entered the bus and saw the full extent of the horror. Ken had already seen a myriad of horrific crime scenes over the course of his almost 20 years in service, but the murder of Tim McLean was the one that would shake him most. Throughout Ken's career with the RCMP, he took advantage of psychiatric help and continued with treatment after his retirement. However, the continued effects of PTSD would eventually erode away the foundations of his marriage, and he separated from his wife Sherry in 2011. When Ken read of Vincent Lee and his growing list of freedoms, he began to have flashbacks. Ken's ex-wife Sherry recalls his rapid decline into depression. He would take his life in July of 2014. Although separated, his ex-wife Sherry felt the immense loss. She felt as though responsibility should be put in the hands of RCMP, that the onus was on them to ensure the mental health of employees exposed to traumatic situations. She started a nationwide campaign lobbying for PTSD awareness and currently speaks across the country for the cause. The brain is a powerful organ and can create entire worlds for the observer only, detaching them from our common reality. Putting someone in a mental hospital rather than a prison means that there is hope they can heal and overcome whatever mental illness has taken them, returning them to their true selves. Whereas a prison is for offenders who were proven to have made their choices consciously and of free will. In the years that followed his initial incarceration, multiple doctors observed and treated Vincent, seeing marked improvement in his mental state alongside the acceptance of his actions and the life he had taken. Vincent was eventually able to differentiate the imagined voice from reality and under treatment eliminated the alleged voice entirely. He would spend eight years incarcerated for treatment at Selkirk Mental Facility routinely taking his prescribed antipsychotic drug, olanzapine. After a steady loosening of restrictions surrounding his incarceration, in 2016, he would formally change his name to Will Baker and petition to live free, independently from the Selkirk Mental Health Facility. In 2017, his petition was granted with the Manitoba Criminal Code ruling that Vincent be free of all legal obligations and restrictions on his independent living. He is now living in Manitoba and has a controversial new chance at starting his life free from his disease. In an interview with the Schizophrenic Society of Canada CEO Chris Somerville, Vincent displayed what appeared to be genuine remorse and was vocal about his regret and shame in the horrific act he committed. An advocate for treatable mental illnesses, Chris felt as though Vincent's story needed to be told, telling the Winnipeg Free Press in an email accompanying the 45-minute interview tape that, what we have here are two victims from two families who are the victims of untreated, uncontrolled psychosis. This is clearly true on a fact-based, black-and-white basis. The question still remains if justice has been duly served or if it has come up short, as many believe. Vincent claims to now understand his affliction and continues to take his medications, aware of what to do if the voice returns. 
there is no way of knowing what is going through Vincent's mind, if he is the treatable and treated schizophrenic doctors believe him to be, or a hyper-intelligent killer who got away with murder. Carol has been the most outspoken individual in this tragic event, the loss of her son driving her to petition and lobby a law that would ensure justice for future victims of mental health homicides or similar. Called Tim's Law, it is a law that prevents any mentally ill person who commits a crime from being released. In an interview in 2014, Vincent responds to that law, agreeing with it, despite his thought that it would not pass Senate. She would pursue suits against Greyhound, the Attorney General of Canada, and Vincent Lee, all of which would ultimately be dropped, causing her extraordinary financial stress, which persists to this day. Five months after Tim's murder, a woman came forward announcing the birth of her and Tim's child on December 21, 2008. A sad battle played out in family court, with Carol winning custody of the young newborn perhaps feeling a sort of postnatal depression. Although undoubtedly a caring mother for the boy, Carol fought hard and then sheltered the boy from many people, including grandfather Tim Sr., who has not seen his grandson in a number of years. The boy's maternal mother allegedly had a dispute with Carol in January of 2018 during a supervised visit and has not seen her son since. Tim Sr. only has pictures to remind him of his son, one of which he tattooed over his heart, a perpetual tribute to his progeny. Timothy Sr.'s road has been a tough one, kept at arm's length for most of the proceedings. He is dealing with the pain of losing his son day by day, the dramatic isolation from his grandson only adding to the grief. This list is too long to complete. By all accounts, Tim was a cherished individual, full of a unique passion for life that was entirely infectious and addictive. There are multiple groups and forums around the net dedicated to his memory that are still active today over 10 years later. This story was particularly hard for me. In researching the person that Timothy was, the effect he had on everyone he met, and the tragic turn of events that would take his life, I came to the realization that he would have been someone I myself would have liked very much. As I write this sentence, I can't help but feel a certain level of awe in Timothy and his cleverly guided fly-by-night persona, his infectious curiosity to both see and embrace the world, cherishing every step of the way, highlights facets of my own self I need to look upon and reassess in the wholesome pursuit of happiness. Thank you once again for watching or listening. And I apologize for the delay in this episode's release. This story forced the question of knowing right from wrong and all the factors that contribute to that answer. It took me some time to find a balance where I could write from a place of neutrality, and it was hard. Thank you for your likes, shares, and comments. Subscriptions for my channel are growing every episode, and it's an exciting thing to watch. I appreciate all of your support. Don't forget to hit that bell to be notified when new episodes are up. And until then, thank you for joining me in this episode 5 of Something Criminal. <laughs>